Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to By Design. Today we are going to be discussing heroes in an RTS setting. So obviously an RTS is a real-time strategy. Um, I'm going to be breaking it down pretty granularly at first, and we're going to look at some examples of heroes in an RTS in games that should be familiar to people who have watched the channel, but also who have just played RTSs before. And so let's start out with uh, just discussing what actually a hero unit is, the purpose that they generally serve, why people would want to include heroes in the first place, and we'll get into some more of the nitty gritty as we continue on. So a hero unit tends to be just a unit with additional significance. Uh, oftentimes they represent a character of the game's story, and they're generally included to make the player feel more attached to whatever that character is. You get an in-game representation of that character, and you get to say... You know, this is that character. This is what they are when it comes to a uh, combatant. And I can use them in this context, and they're, they've got these weaknesses and these strengths. And you know, maybe if you want to get really into the, the storytelling, the, the plumb the depths of that particular unit, you might even be able to make some weird connection between their weaknesses and strengths as a unit, and how that makes sense and, and dials back into that character's uh, faults and that character's strengths as just an individual. Uh, but typically, we don't think too hard about that stuff when we're designing heroes. Uh, although, I will, well, maybe I shouldn't say we there. I'm sure a lot of people do. Uh, but that tends to be a secondary consideration, especially since historically heroes have either been really, really, uh, you know, bland, I guess, in terms of their implementation compared to some of the other mechanics, uh, or they've been so, so far apart and so far removed from anything else that's in the game that they almost become too different, too dissimilar, and kind of start genre bending the game in a way that it probably doesn't necessarily benefit the title overall. And so we're going to be giving a bunch of different examples. I'm sure you can already figure out which kind of titles I'm talking about when I say the former and the latter kind of a hero inclusion. Uh, they also demonstrate, typically, that in the narrative, that character is experiencing whatever section of the story they are present for in a uh, gameplay context uh, alongside the player themselves. So they, they are experiencing that part of the story. You know, when you, if, for example, in Brood War, when you're ordering around Jim Rayner, he's experiencing that part of the story with you. And the same for Phoenix and the same for all the other characters. So you get to see where they are in the narrative at a certain point. And you get to say, okay, well, at this point, I remember playing as that character. And so I can sort of remember what the events of that mission were. And I know that that character knows about those. And so it's just like a bunch of subconscious elements there as well. So it, it is useful. We can see where there would be value in that from a narrative standpoint. But what really falls apart on a lot of the examples that I'm about to, about to list typically tends to be the gameplay aspect of things. Like, yes, it's good for a story to have a character that the player knows has seen some shit, has gone through some trials and tribulations and experienced part of the story. It helps that player relate to that character. And so it improves their relatability, but it also improves uh, their... I guess it ingratiates the, the character with the player, you could say. Because they know what they have seen and what they haven't seen. And so if there's going to be some dramatic irony, it's much easier to set up if that character has already demonstrated to the player that they know or don't know something. And of course, vice versa, if you just want to talk about a character's traits or their experiences so far, then you should be able to easily see what that character is like or, you know, just based on, on what they have seen and what they haven't seen. You should be able to essentially write your own answers to questions or write your own lines in situations. The dialogue kind of writes itself if the player knows what to expect in that sense. And so characters will feel more like they are belong in the setting. They'll feel more grounded when they say something um, that's out of character deliberately by the, the script writer to like try and throw the player for a loop. That will also be more effective if you're trying to subvert expectations. But typically, just in an average everyday scenario, the characters delivering a certain line that basically adds gravitas and emphasis. Their inclusion in past events adds gravitas and emphasis to that particular line. It adds backing. It makes it feel real. And so these are all really, really important reasons from a story perspective, from a narrative perspective, to include heroes in your game. And so one of the reasons why I'm going to be focusing so heavily on gameplay aspects, not just because I do feel that gameplay is the most important part of a game, it's also to try and educate developers and players and whoever else is interested as to, you know, ways that you can improve a hero's inclusion and how you might be able to make use of this veritable gold mine that is a character as a hero included as a unit in the game um, that's definitely really really important for your narrative and so you want to be able to include that without detracting from the experience of the player because maybe they're uh you know a basically a, a liability or maybe they're just a luxury you know either one is not necessarily good 
especially if the player didn't earn that liability and didn't earn that luxury. So you want to make sure that they don't serve to abstract the gameplay and, and basically become a gimmick. Um, but you also don't want them to be too much of a, uh, I guess, dead weight. So first things first, we're going to talk about the early days of RTS and their hero units. So mostly going to be referencing Warcraft 2 and Brood War. Obviously, people who have played those games or at least have a passing knowledge of those games will know that heroes tend to be empowered versions of existing units. Uh, oftentimes, they share the same graphic. The only thing that would be different is team color, uh, maybe a sprite, uh, but the same combat role like uh, Sarah Kerrigan, for example, as a ghost. Um, and they might have custom portraits. They might have custom voice lines. Uh, typically, they would have both of those things, especially in Brood War. Uh, but for, um, you know, uh, Warcraft 2, maybe they have like a different... Uh, portrait in the sense of like a different image uh, unit picture uh, but they would have like a different name different stats generally speaking uh, but otherwise they'd behave very similar to existing units uh, so there's not really a change in their combat role they simply play like what the base unit plays like except they're way better at the job uh, another thing to consider is that in brood war the only example of a unique hero unit that i can think of off the top of my head would be infested kerrigan who doesn't have a corollary when it comes to a base unit. There's no base unit that casts Psy Storm, Ensnare, Consume, Can Cloak, Attacks and Melee, uh, so on and so forth. So she really does feel like a unique hero in that respect. Compare that to the normal Sarah Kerrigan unit, which while it does have a custom sprite compared to the normal Ghost, still has Cloak and Lockdown, doesn't paint nukes unlike the original Ghost, um, and generally speaking just exists to... Uh, be a beefier ghost that deals more damage to organic units well technically more damage to everything more damage to small units and um you know locks down and stuff so they play very very similarly oftentimes these heroes have to move to beacons or circles of power they were called in warcraft 2 and this is for mission progress or victory think the revolution mission in uh, the original vanilla campaign of uh, rebel yell um, in starcraft you had to move kerrigan to a beacon to reveal the or, or to gain the allegiance of the antigans uh, so like that's mission progress oftentimes you'll have to move a hero unit around to you know maybe a beacon at the end of a level in order to win uh, so you have to cross thresholds with them basically use them for map triggers and typically when you lose the unit you lose the mission so these units are pre-placed at the start of the map or you get them as part of a scripted event like in the first ued mission in brood war where you get duran uh, almost always you'll get that unless you somehow manage to like kill the enemy with vultures or something uh, you're gonna get him because he also has your gas so you're gonna scout out you're gonna find him and there you have it uh, so they tend to be pre-placed at map start uh, it tends to be unavoidable you can't opt into using them uh, so you have to protect them or you lose the mission. This makes them um, paradoxically significant and insignificant, but in bad ways. Causing defeat for the player, in my opinion, is a very silly abstraction, and it prevents their use in some cases, or at, at best it'll just discourage their use, right? You're going to feel a lot more secure in the mission, especially if you're deciding to not save, uh, like I tend to do. If you are just going to, you know... Uh, shove them in your mineral line or shove them in you know, relegate them to base defense put them on hockey zero control group zero and then just not think about them ever again um, and they tend to be too similar to other units in the game uh, to uh, warrant usage in large engagements like yes rainer may be uh, the equivalent of like having five vultures or ten marines or something but you can it's much easier to get ten marines and then use that in a control group and you know know that okay that may have cost me 500 minerals but it's way different than costing me the entire mission and having to restart or load a save or whatever. So their utility is entirely relegated to micro missions that shouldn't be in the game anyway, or micro sections of missions or some sort of early game situation where it makes sense to use them. But there's always going to be a point in large scale engagements and large scale missions where you'd much rather just have some basic units and you'd much rather not use them at all and just keep the, these hero units in your base. So in this case, it's pretty obvious to see where the flaws are. It's not really that nuanced. You just see that they, yeah, sure, they were in the battle, but typically they don't feel like they fought in the battle. They don't feel like they were on the front lines per se, especially if it's not a micro mission or it's not a micro section or it's not an early game where you can use them. Uh, it, it just tends to be something that they, they sit there in, on, behind the sunken colony line or the photon cannon line or bunker line or whatever. And they sit there and they, you know, sit in your town hall, they sit in your resource lines, whatever. They're not going to be doing anything, really, uh, after the certain, you know, threshold of time. So, moving on to a uh, newer, more recent age 
Uh, we can talk about RPG heroes. I'm sure everybody knew that I was going to be talking about Warcraft 3 when they saw the title of this video. But I'm also going to throw in some re uh, references to Warlords Battlecry, which is a lesser known series that mixed RPG elements a little bit more, ex ex uh, yeah, exhaustively, I would say, a little bit more extensively than Warcraft 3 did, which may come as a surprise to people who are not initiated in the game. So the units that were considered heroes in this, uh, these two game franchises, or just Warcraft 3 and then the Battlecry franchise, were wildly different than any other unit in the game. They had entirely different stats and abilities, and they were based around progression systems. So this is like, obviously, leveling up in Warcraft 3. Everybody tends to be familiar with that. You level up and you pick uh, an upgrade to your existing ability, or you get a new skill or whatever. And you also get additional stats, uh, health, mana, HP regen, health regen, armor, attack speed, whatever. Uh, so that is all built around you gaining experience, which tends to be locked to one level per mission. Uh, so you can only get, you know, go from level one to two in the first mission. You can't go to from level one to three, for example, typically. Anyways, uh, they can also hold items and doing so and uh, allow, I guess allows them to interact with the game economy, right? Uh, very different ways than any other unit. And this makes them more significant than any other unit as well, because this is how you can make money in the game. This is how you can get resources to build more units and that in and of itself is you're sort of investing time more so than you're investing resources into them, but they do give you resources back if you sell an item or you convert a mine in Battlecry or something like that. Like that tends to be something that you're doing very commonly in these titles, and it's all built around these particular units. They have some persistence mechanic. Uh, for Warcraft 3, it's revival after death if you decide to opt into the time and resource cost in order to produce them. And they often um, are present in the next battle in Battlecry. So unless you pick, like, I think the Iron Man mode or something uh, where your death is permanent, you, uh, where, where at that point you're basically safe scumming most of the time, I imagine. Uh, you tend to just, uh, you know, as soon as you lose your hero, you uh, either restart the mission if you want to, but if, if you win or whether you win or lose, the next mission your hero will be back. Uh, so my verdict on this tends to be that they are too significant for an RTS. Their inclusion in RTS games, like uh, Warcraft 3 and these Battlecry games, uh, they involved creating entirely new systems in the gameplay, and they don't tend to have much interaction, much uh, cross-referencing with traditional RTS mechanics. So these are mechanics like leveling up and claiming items and converting mines even. At the very least, for Battlecry, converting mines is something you can do with some later tier units. And you can also build structures with them, which you can build with builders, too. So there's some crossover there. Uh, but with Warcraft 3 especially, uh, you know, items and leveling up and stuff, this doesn't happen to other units. Uh, War Battlecry did try to make it so that there was unit veterancy and that that had something to do with it. But typically, you didn't really notice the difference between a max level, you know, skeleton, for example, and a... a, a you know, barely leveled up skeleton or like a, a minimum level skeleton. Uh, so it's not really the same thing as unit veterancy, for example, in the later Command and Conquer titles. Uh, that was obviously a lot more game changing. And when it comes to uh, Warcraft 3, there's no other unit that levels up. So it's only the heroes. Claiming items is also something that's in both of these particular titles. Uh, but while you can sell items in the middle of gameplay for uh, Warcraft 3, you couldn't do that until the third Battlecry game, which I haven't actually played yet on my channel, so people won't know it if they're only looking at the games that I've played. And uh, it tended to not have anything to do with regular units, right? Uh, you could backpack un items in Warcraft 3, so units could actually pick up items and bring them over to their heroes, but they couldn't use it themselves. And they were limited to two slots versus the six of a hero. So still a bit of an abstraction there, but it's sort of the same inventory system in that sense. Uh, hero losses in these games tended to be binary. So either the player was in uh, put into a position where they were at enough of a disadvantage that they may as well just restart the mission um, because they lost their hero in a, a key moment, which you can say is a fair system. So, you know, if you lose the hero, then and, and you don't have enough of a buffer of economy or uh, defense structures or whatever to rebuy them. Uh, then, of course, you know, you should expect to lose the mission in that respect. And I, I can see where that makes sense. But oftentimes it was either that or it was that they just didn't matter enough at all. So even if you lost them, you were still going to have an easy victory. This is talking about the base campaigns, of course, not any custom content. And so the same tends to be true with uh, Warlords Battlecry. Depending on the difficulty you have, you could have your hero and not use him at all besides converting your initial minds and, like, immediately suicide him, either intentionally or otherwise. And, you know, maybe you would win with ease, or you would basically be losing regardless of the hero's inclusion. So it tended to be feast or famine, like either they were so useful that they were 
you know, losing them was a death sentence, or they were not really that important at all, in which case losing them didn't matter to you whatsoever. And so in both of those cases, I would much rather that the game was tuned to not involve heroes to that extent, where the heroes are so, uh, you know, game-changing that they completely uh, involve themselves within the balance. So there is somewhere in between these two that has been explored by the AAA games industry, and this is also a Blizzard set of titles. So this is for StarCraft II, a Heart of the Swarm, as well as the Nova Covert Ops DLC and the Co-op Commanders that happen to have heroes. And uh, I have not played some of the more recent Co-op Commanders, so some of this stuff may not hold true for them, uh, but uh, I'm not really willing to give Blizzard the benefit of the doubt based on what I've already experienced, but obviously if you have uh, take issue with something I say in this particular section with regards to Co-op Commanders, feel free to comment and tell me where you think I got it wrong. Uh, wildly different than any other unit in the game is also something that can be said for these particular heroes, and they are all... They all do have some sort of progression system, don't they? I was going to say maybe the co-op ones don't, but typically the, if you have a hero unit, you have to level up your co-op commander. But after a certain point, you just get to a point where you're just adding additional stats. Uh, it's still a progression system. You could still say that that's the case. So much like Warcraft 3 and Battlecry, uh, these heroes do have progression systems built around them. And they do have these things that you can level up in between maps. So it's more like Battlecry than it is like Warcraft 3, but the progression system is still there nonetheless. They are also completely different units, so there's not no unit that plays like them in StarCraft II. There's no unit that is even remotely comparable, aside from another hero, of course. And so uh, they can be customized between maps, and in later stages they are completely overpowered to the point where they can just hold off entire waves on max difficulty in any of these particular parts of StarCraft II. Uh, Heart of the Swarm, Nova, and Co-op again. So... Uh, these tend to be also pre-placed at map start. That's another thing that I forgot to mention about Warcraft 3 heroes as well. They're, they're pre-placed at map start. They're not opt-in. So the same thing is true for these StarCraft 2 ones. They are pre-placed at map start. They, uh, If they die, unlike the Warcraft 3 ones or even the Battlecry ones, they revive after a certain amount of time automatically. There's no resource cost to the player. It's just a time cost and an opportunity cost of what you could have done if your hero wasn't dead. So those are the only sort of disadvantages you get. Um, and again, it can sort of suffer from the same issues as what I mentioned with Warcraft 3 and Battlecry, where it can be feast or famine. Either dying has no consequence at all, or dying has too much consequence, because without them, you have no other ways to be useful. Uh, especially in co-op, this tends to be the case where like somebody like Alarak, for example, uh, you know, yes, he does have some powerful tech, uh, but in, especially after you know, the early levels on Brutal Difficulty, you weren't really allowed to do much if you didn't have your hero. And so in the early moments of those particular, um, you know, runs, I often found that I was reliant on my co-op partner more than I wanted to be if I was going to be playing as Alarak and I somehow lost him or just wasn't using him to the fullest effect. And that's, again, the same sort of feast and or famine thing. My verdict on this particular setup is that this is whole thing, this whole system is completely absurd. You know, Blizzard managed to make a hero system that is both, abs uh, you know, like I said, absurd, uh, where you're destroying entire armies with just one unit. And it's also boring because the revival at no cost means, again, it's either feast or famine. So, again, it's boring. It's not really in my control. All abilities have nothing to do with RTS mechanics. They just end up being point and click indicator snooze fest where you create some indicators on the ground. And, you know, even if it was PvP, it would still be boring because... It's just an indicator, which is basically the RTS version of a quick time event where, oh, don't stand in the indicator and don't take ambient damage and stuff. And obviously the same complaint could be levied at the boss fights of uh, StarCraft 2 as well. And these are all in service to a set of campaigns or in co-op's case, a set of content uh, that never take form into RTS missions. The most you have is some resource gathering and army management. You barely expand in these maps. You barely expand in even in co-op. You only expand once. Um, you never really have to do anything with regards to uh, experiencing like what an RTS actually is of managing multiple bases and making max food armies, you have these heroes that do the job for you. So what this comes down to is basically when I was looking to include heroes in my uh, Brood War projects from 2018 onward, uh, especially after I finished the 1.0 version of Hydra in the uh, remastered version of Brood War, I had to come up with an alternative to this. I had to come up with something that worked better than any of these examples that I've seen. And as a bit of a disclaimer, I haven't played every single RTS. I don't know what it's like in, for example, Age of Empires, if there are hero units there. I'm probably, I would assume that they are. there are hero units in those cases, and they're probably more like the early days, uh, like Warcraft 2 and, and Brood War. Haven't played Warcraft 1, or for that matter, Warcraft 2 that much. I have not played uh, any other instances where you see 
hero units for an extensive period of time. Like some of the command and conquer missions have like commando units or whatever hero units in that sense where if you if they die you lose but usually that's like a micro context sense it's not something that's a consistent mechanic um whereas in brood war it was around often enough to be considered a mechanic and for uh, warcraft 3 and starcraft 2 the points where there were heroes were you basically had heroes in every single mission so in that sense um when i was looking at an alternative to everything that i had seen before i wanted to take what worked from all of them and then leave everything else behind and what would work in the context of large-scale version of brood war and so when i'm dealing with something like hydra 2.0 um, it's a little bit different than it is with single player content but i'll talk about both of them uh, so at a glance these hero units that i've decided to include look like they're just empowered versions of existing units they have maybe less stats than you might expect the hero to have, so they are still maybe squishier than you might expect or something like that, but they can be specialized via upgrades, and these upgrades will add additional tools that reward uh, good positioning and precise micro. The heroes themselves will already reward these things, uh, but these upgrades will give you further incentives to do so, further interactions to build upon, and, and they tend to add not so much additional complexity or depth, insofar as the hero will already have those things in spades when it just comes out of the production facility, but uh, they will help the player uh, be rewarded uh, for positioning them correctly, essentially. So the player still has to make a decision, even with an upgraded version of this hero, that is correct in order to reap rewards. That was the first thing that I decided, is that a lot of these heroes in Warcraft 3 and in uh, Starcraft 2 it, it was more like you, you had to use your hero at all. It wasn't that you had to use them well. You just had to be using them. And so, yes, you could theoretically ha come up with some higher percentage plays or something where it was better to use your hero in this way. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> in this way than that way. But you still had to end up, you know, using them. And it wasn't really that you were uh, able to access any additional depth or get any additional rewards for using them supremely better than, you know, your average Joe. You'd still end up winning the co-op missions in the same way, or, you know, the, there just wasn't enough resistance from the enemies, and there wasn't enough demand for you to be using your spells properly. And most of the time, it was just some abilities on cooldown, and it was some indicators and some this and that, and it didn't end up feeling like an RTS anyways, and not like an RTS unit tends to be. Although in StarCraft II, I guess that's not really the case, because a lot of the units themselves have indicators, like the fucking, uh, uh, what are those units that... Uh, the Protoss have. I completely forgot what they were called, but um, they are built from the robotics facility, so people will know what I'm talking about when they just create this orb and it blows up. So, essentially, uh, I wanted to make it so that these heroes were essentially really micro-focused units, units that rewarded positioning and micro. And so I did decided to set out to do that. Then you would have upgrades that increase the rewards yielded by proper usage. And so there's already like a, a skill floor required to get uh, a proper amount of return of investment at all. The upgrades increase the skill ceiling rather than the floor itself. So you can always get some benefits from positioning them well, but the upgrades increase the, uh, I guess, the amount of benefits you can get the more uh, you efficiently use the unit. That's the idea anyways on paper. And for Hydra, like I mentioned uh, when I alluded to them coming out of production facilities, in Project Hydra's 2.0 version, these heroes will be opt-in. They were, they're not pre-placed, they're not available at the map start, they have to be purchased. They cost resources, supply, and time, and they require a specific structure. So that structure produces them and also upgrades them. And so this is very different than any other RTS I've played that has hero units. You know, the closest thing would be like super units or something like that in uh, some of the later Command & Conquer titles. But I don't want super units, I want hero units that um, require, again, good positioning, and still have that element of feeling like a champion of that race or a, uh, you know, some sort of character like Raynor, Kerrigan, etc. And that, to me, will be more rewarding than, you know, have, building some mech or something that uh, ends up being a super unit. Uh, obviously, just, I don't want them to be able to wipe out entire armies, but I want them to, in, under the right circumstances, be able to give the player the proper amount of rewards based on the money that they've invested into them. So the, that is a bit of a, a design issue when it comes to that, like it poses a design challenge, but it's one that I'm willing to approach just in that regard. For single player projects like in Consummate 2.0 or some of the other stuff like Deliverance that I mentioned before, the Protoss project, um, these will be pre-placed at map start and they will require a specific structure to produce or upgrade or whatever, um, mostly just upgrade. 
you're, they're not going to revive. Uh, so for the most part, you'll just be upgrading them. Maybe you'll be able to like swap their forms or something like Rainer Marine into Rainer Vulture sort of thing for those particular things. Uh, but most of the time, it'll just be upgrades, and you know maybe you can heal them or something as a, a, a you know pay some money or some time or something to uh, provide the hero with a, a heal is one idea that I was playing around with. I'm not sure if I'm going to go with that in particular. Uh, but these would provide additional utility for the hero, essentially. And this way, you still have that personification, that representation of a character in your narrative uh, actually doing stuff in your your story, in your gameplay. And so your their role, their combat role, tells a story about their character and tells the player what kind of character they are and sort of reinforces those traits while also not feeling like Again, you you know you're being punished for their inclusion at all because again, when you lose the unit, they don't it doesn't end in map defeat and they don't revive. Instead, they just escape, quote unquote, uh, through various animations. So like a, a unit with cloaking, like Gosca in Inconsummate or Kerrigan in Hydra, will cloak, but for all players, the player that controls them and allies to that particular player included, and so that animation will look like they just vanished and. You know, then the player will get a transmission saying, hey, you know, it's getting too hot, I'm out of here, or whatever. And those animations and sound cues will tell the player everything they need to know about, oh, I lost my hero. Uh, but then they will reappear in later maps, similar to Battlecry. There will be no defeat trigger, like I said. So it's not like that unit has a tremendous amount of additional responsibility for the player. Uh, so you're not, like, resentful that they were included in the mission. You're not like, oh, shit. I, it's sort of like uh, anytime you experience a situation where you have to escort allies somewhere, typically the response is, oh, fuck. You know, I've got a, I'm at the will of this, you know, AI that's potentially very poor. And now I'm beholden to them as opposed to beholden to my own skill. I don't want any situation that's similar to that at all, especially when it comes to hero units that I want to be, you know, empowering to the player if they do decide to opt in and use them. And so my verdict with, obviously this is not something that's out there releasable for you to experience just yet, but this is my proposed alternative. And this is one of the reasons why I was making this video in the first place was to really show you guys and show myself uh, the failures of the earlier systems and the potential of my own and maybe crowdsource some opinions on it because this is the first time I'm releasing a formal discussion about that particular discussion uh, or about that particular mechanic rather. And so... Um, like I said, I think it's promising. You know, it still allows the unit to represent the character, especially in single-player narratives, but it doesn't sacrifice player engagement. It doesn't end on defeat when you lose the unit. Micro-oriented, hero-minded players are going to opt into the, using that unit in the first place. They will specialize them with upgrades. They would use the hero even if it was a defeat condition. They're going to try to express their playstyle, whatever the case may be. This just allows them to do that. And again, it does pose that design challenge where the resources they spend on the hero and the hero's upgrades and etc., they need to be used effectively in order to achieve victory. Like, yes, I do want the hero to be to require a skill four in order to use correctly. And maybe that is higher than using a you know a marine or something. Uh, but it would still use RTS mindset when it comes to a balancing and the mechanics therein. And I'll get into more nitty gritty when I get closer to shipping a project like that, I suppose, or maybe in reflection to that. Um, but yes, it, it is going to add uh, an additional design overhead for that particular thing, but it doesn't mean that it's uh, you know something that I shouldn't chase. And so that's something where it's sort of like, you know, if it was easy, maybe it wouldn't be worth doing. Like nothing worth doing is easy. That sort of mindset is what I approach that. My final thoughts on the whole thing for heroes is that I do think that they can be used in RTS campaigns. And I, I think that it makes sense to provide the players with, uh, again, an in-game representation of a character in a narrative. I hope that my proposed alternative, especially compared to heroes that you've seen before and the systems you've seen before in RTS games, um, can be used to contribute positively uh, to the experience of playing the game and using the hero. And again, I don't want them to be relegated to the mineral line or to some defensive position. I, I don't want you to, you know, add them to hotkey control group zero and just you know, tab to them every now and then and see it where they are. And I don't want them to clutter up the screen with needless user interfaces like in StarCraft II or WarCraft III. I don't want them to have a crazy amount of systems built around them. I want to use the existing RTS systems like upgrades that you already get for normal units. You Okay, you can get them for heroes now. You build a unit, or rather a factory, that builds a specific kind of unit. You do the same thing for your hero. Like that sort of stuff. I don't want it to be something that is such an abstraction on the base system of what an RTS tends to be that it feels completely foreign. At the same time, I want it to feel impactful and useful. And so that is where I have to marry these two kind of mindsets and positions closely, and carefully rather, so that I can create a system that is useful. 
So if you have any ideas on the topic or you take contention with anything that I said, I'd be happy to hear your thoughts and uh, have at you in the comments section. Obviously, you can also continue this discussion on my Discord server and wherever else you feel like discussing it with me or with my audience. Uh, thanks again for everybody who tunes into these and expect a couple more of them in the future as I get back into the developer's mindset since I've been busy uh, streaming very recently. So thanks again for listening to me ramble on and choke out of dehydration. I'll be seeing you guys on the next by design video probably sooner than you might think.